What's up, everybody? Sunday session, episode 44, here to deliver a ton of information to help you scale your Amazon business. For anybody who's this your first time joining, my name is Eric Castellano. I'm the owner of Amazon Lit, which is a consulting company that helps sellers at all levels build their Amazon businesses. Super excited to be here. The purpose of this call is basically a live Q&A. Any questions you have about your Amazon company, you post them in the chat, and I'll answer them. Shamari asked for new sellers, what's a good number of companies to research before and hit up at sweets and snacks, trying to avoid spinning wheels or getting analysis paralysis overload? Yeah, so realistically, Shamari, I would pinpoint it to like your top five. So you should have 10 or 15 that you definitely want to talk to, but like you should have your top five. Five, where it's like, listen, if I'm not able to get to those other 10 or 15, because a lot of times these booths are very busy. You walk by one time, there's 12 people there, they're talking, you wait 10 minutes, you're like, oh, I don't want to wait anymore. You leave, you come back, there's still a bunch of people there. So sometimes you're not even going to get a chance to connect with some of these companies. Uh, but I think if you have a list of like 10 or 15 that you definitely want to talk to, and then the top five where it's like, listen, regardless of what's happened, what happens at this event, I'm going to go talk to these top five companies because after exploring their listings, their images could use some better uh, updates. They could use some infographics, some lifestyle shots. They could use some SEO optimization as well as some keyword research can be added in there. Maybe their bullet points are trash. Their title is trash. Like all of that information you can put all, put together. Um, and, and, and Shamar, you're right. It's very easy to get overwhelmed, right? That's why I suggest five. You know, and you might not think five's enough because it's like five. What if what, what if they all say no? You know, and that's what the backup 10 or 15 or four. But you don't got to overwhelm yourself. You don't got to go there and be like, I'm, I need to talk to 30 companies. That's just too much. It's too much. It's it's an outland. It's an unrealistic expectation of yourself. Hey, Eric, I made a sale on all my aging inventory over 180 days, but it seems to be selling below the price I set it for. Should I reach out to Amazon and see if there is a problem? First, I check manage inventory and make sure that your listed price is actually the price that's listed on Amazon and make sure that if you're using a repricer, you've double checked that. And then if you've checked all those bases and for some odd reason, if your price is listed below your listed price, which absolutely should not be, then you create a case with Amazon. And the only reason I say first dive a little deeper is because it's, it's very, very rare that something like that would happen. You know, it's usually a user issue, a user error. This is a great question. Is it cheaper to dispose or liquidate stale inventory? So liquidation, they're going to give you for like a $20 product. You're lucky if you get you know, 80 cents to a buck back on a, on a product that sells for $20. Um, but it may be the move. You figure in a product that sells for $20 at a 40% cost of goods, you're looking at about eight bucks in inventory cost. So you'll essentially be losing about seven bucks on that item. Now, if you were to dispose of it, you would be losing the whole $8 on that cost of goods plus the disposal fee which Amazon doubled in, I want to say, February or March. So, for example, let's do disposal fee, and they're really high right now. So, for a product that weighs more than two pounds, it's $2.83 for the first two pounds and six for each pound after that. So, that's crazy. Let's bust out. Let's just say the product weighs, we'll say, eight pounds. Right. So so in order to calculate the disposal fee for an eight pound product, this is going to blow your mind. Right. We're assuming the cost of goods is eight bucks. So it's eight bucks cost of goods, eight pound product. Let's calculate the disposal fee. So one oh six for each pound over two pounds, eight pound product. So six or eight minus two is six pounds. So six times one oh six is 636 for the additional six pounds. Now we have to add the 283 for the first two pounds plus 106 times six plus 283. So the cost to dispose of an eight pound product is $9.19. So not only is Amazon charging you $9.18 or 19 cents to dispose of the product, 
but then you're losing all of your cost of goods, right? So plus eight, a $17.19 loss. Disposing of inventory usually is never the option, right? Unless it's expired already. And in that case, there's nothing you can really do with it because you can't donate it or anything. So to answer your question, is it cheaper to dispose or liquidate? You got to run the numbers, but typically we prefer not to liquidate or dispose of anything. Usually we're pulling it back to our warehouse and donating it because then we can deduct that income against our taxable income at the end of the year. Units, yeah, we, we, we keep a consistent production cost per ASIN, right? Because the way we look at our business is an ecosystem. And in order to keep the entire ecosystem operating, it's oversized, it's hazmat, it's small and light, it's standard size, it's private label, it's wholesale, it's retail arbitrage, right? It's all of these things collective in a conglomerate in one ecosystem. Right. So when you look at the ecosystem as a whole, it makes sense to calculate your production cost per ASIN based on the entirety of the inventory that you shipped out of your warehouse or home or fulfillment center in that allotted time period that you're analyzing. Super important to do that. Now, that does not mean you cannot have different buying requirements for, say, small and light, hazmat or oversized. That's where the magic comes in. So production cost per ASIN is to understand what it costs you to get a product out the door to set minimum buying requirements. And then based on those production costs per ASIN that you have calculated, you're then able to set pricing tiers for different classifications of products, whether hazmat, oversized, small and light, standard size. Do we have a distributor or wholesale license noticed on supply chain that there are distributors that don't sell to retailers but only to wholesalers no i don't have a wholesale license well with with my wholesale business i do but that that business has absolutely no affiliation with my amazon company um and we don't even use it to purchase inventory for our amazon company if your ad costs are too high you got to make adjustments to your ad costs you know play around with the budget put in negative keywords add new keywords I think the biggest thing about ads is you got to understand a SEO optimization, how keywords work. And then you got to do your research on what keywords you should be targeting to get the best bang for your buck, essentially. But a lot of the magic with PPC comes in with working and reworking your campaign. So popping in every couple of days and making the adjustments, right? If your A cost is too high, pinpoint why. Are there certain keywords that are driving up your A cost? There probably are. Can you remove those keywords? You probably could. Could you decrease the bid on some of those keywords? Absolutely. Could you increase the bid on the ones that are performing better? Sure can, right? So it's really about managing these campaigns, diving into them, analyzing them, making educated uh, decisions and changes to them, and then doubling down on what works and eliminating what doesn't. Uh, Mr. Boo, what's the requirement to join these sellers arrive for beginners? Uh, you just have to have a level of motivation and commitment and the investment to join, which right now is $3,000. We also offer a, point, a payment plan. Patty's World FBA asked, what does she do with inventory that says zero have been received? So until the shipment can be reconciled at the top of the shipment, it will say the shipment cannot be reconciled until insert date it might be May 30th, right? So until that date of May 30th, you cannot even open up an investigation for those missing units. So usually by the date of reconciliation, the inventory will be received. Because what's happening right now is Amazon's moving it around to fulfillment center to fulfillment center. They're checking it in, right? So they're processing your inventory, which sometimes takes some time. Um, so you have to wait until the reconciliation date, Patty. But if the reconciliation date has passed, then you would submit the documentation. And usually, and there'll be an option to submit that documentation um, on the shipment page. And usually what it'll be is some sort of invoice proving that you purchased the inventory, as well as some sort of sh shipping document proving that you shipped the inventory. Um, usually the scan in from UPS will suffice. If you're sending pallets, then the bill of lading from the carrier will suffice. But they're going to want to document and make sure that you have this information. And really, that was just my point. Like, I, I love jumping on these calls because every like 
literally every business in the inner circle is so different, so different. So yeah, they're all selling on Amazon. Majority of them are all wholesale businesses. But when I dive into these companies and like, so for example, in a couple of weeks, Sebastian and I are going to Canada to visit two of our inner circle members. I've already been to their warehouse two times already. Right. And their business is completely different from the business in the warehouse. Sebastian was just out in Queens last week. Right. Or when we were in Miami a couple months ago or Sebastian was in Columbia two months ago. Like every business that we meet with is so unique and it's so cool because we're able to meet your business where it's at because we have the experience to do so. Right. And the cool thing is, is if I don't know an answer to something. And this is something I learned. I used to kind of bullshit early on, right? Um, I'd be like, I would share what I think I knew about the topic instead of just admitting, hey, I don't have the answer to that. Let me find someone who does and get back to you. And now I'm 100% comfortable doing that because that's part of this process. I can't have all the answers. I'm just one human. I'm just a regular dude, a regular guy on a regular Sunday talking to regular people, right? So I don't have all the answers. Do I have a lot of them? Absolutely. And do I have access to someone who has the answers? A hundred percent I do. A hundred percent. Did you ever use a prep center? What made you think it was better to get your own warehouse? So yeah, we've used prep centers and we, we still use the prep centers once in a while. Um, the reason we, we got our own warehouse was for mainly quality control and growth. With prep centers, you don't have much say in what happens. You have absolutely no access to the speed of your inventory being prepped. Um, yes, you can sign contracts where they say, hey, we'll get it out of our door in 72 hours. Um, but not many companies are doing that because it's tough to commit to something like that. So the speed in which you can process your inventory in your own space, whether it's in your um, garage, a storage unit, a warehouse, is much faster than you can get it produced with a prep center. Also, our prep costs are pretty par for the course for any prep center, right? So basically, we would essentially be paying what we're paying in rent to prep service fees anyway, right? And now, yes, you have the increase in labor, right? But what that does is gives us the control over our inventory. I don't want someone at a prep center who's never handled my products and doesn't have the same mentality as me because it's not their business making a decision of what products to send and not send based on damages, expirations, um, dents, dings, open products, whatever the case may be. I want someone who's well-trained on my team to make that educated decision. So then if something happens at Amazon, I don't have to run back to a third party to figure out what happened. All I have to do is walk downstairs and be like, guys, what happened with this product? We sent 300 of them. They all got received incorrectly. Like where, where the issue come and what are we going to do to prevent this from ever happening again? Right. Please come to the next meeting with the solution for this. Boom. Immediately solved. But is it a requirement to have a warehouse? Absolutely not. hundred percent, not a requirement. Um, if I was starting all over again with a few thousand bucks, would you start with wholesale? If I only had a few thousand bucks, I probably wouldn't start with wholesale. I'd probably start with online arbitrage or retail arbitrage because there's a much, much lower barrier of entry for those business models. Much lower, much less risk as well. You know, you buy a, an RA product and you list at FBM, it doesn't sell, you can return it. How many products should we sell at one time to have a good profit over a hundred thousand dollars? I mean, let's run the math. Hundred thousand, thirty-three thousand, thirty-three thousand. You should sell thirty, thirty-three thousand items a month at an average profit of three bucks to do a hundred k in gross profits, right? And regardless of how you sell those thirty-three items, it could be thirty-three thousand items. It could be ten SKUs. It could be a thousand SKUs. It could be five SKUs. It could be one SKU. It doesn't matter. When we got our first warehouse, we were probably doing, I want to say, 500 to a million a year, maybe a little less. I don't recall as many, many years ago, um, but I would say probably around there. Oh, that's a great question. How am I using ChatGPT with my Amazon business? I use it for when I create a lot of cases. Um, so for example, I have a brand registered ASIN that needed some listing updates. And for some reason, Amazon wasn't pushing those listing updates, right? So I popped open chat GPT and I copied the email that I sent them. And I said, hey, 
write a professional email to Amazon explaining to them this situation, inserted the situation and asking them to correct it, right? And I went a little more detail with the prompts, but essentially it kicked out this perfect response. I made a few minor tweaks to it and then I sent it and that case worked, right? The other thing I use it for is bullet points for new listing creation. So I will put in the title of the product on ChatGPT and I'll say, hey, create um, an Amazon listing with five bullet points for this specific product. And now never will you be able to just copy and paste all of them. They're all going to need a little bit of work. But what it does is it really provides you the baseline for what it should look like. Also, distributor emails. There's literally so many things you guys could be using ChatGPT GPT for. Well, that's a good question. How long did it take me to get to where I am today? It took me 35 years to get to where I am today. The first 16 were 16 were amazing. The next 10 to 12 were filled with the drug addiction and, and pain and, and anguish and regret and, and horrible, horrible life decisions and, and digging myself uh, to a very deep, deep, deep rock bottom where one day I looked into the mirror and I felt absolutely broken and I just didn't want to live anymore. You know, and I wouldn't take that back for the world. Those those 12 years of anguish and pain that I inflicted on myself um, have made me into the person I am today. And I love the person I am today. I have a lot of respect for the person I am today. My family has a lot of respect for the person I am today. I know a lot of you guys have a lot of respect for the person I've become today. And all of the, the reason I am the person I am today is because of the trials and tribulations that I went through. Right. So it's a huge contributor to my success. And I learned so much about myself as a person, just basically being broken for so long. You know, and sometimes I forget what that was like. I get a little emotional just thinking about it because my life was not like this. Like, I remember days where I would literally be laying at my parents' couch. Like, my parents, they they were very supportive of me, but there came a point at the end where they just couldn't do anything. They, they couldn't have me around anymore. I uh, was just sucking them dry of all their energy. And, and there was a point where I would literally wake up in the morning and I would go on the couch and I'd watch TV until two, three in the morning, right? I'm talking from 8 a.m. to two, three in the morning. I'd only get up to, you know, go hit the restroom, maybe eat something. But like, I just, and literally I had nobody I could call. I just, I was so in my own little bubble and so lost. And I thought my life was over. I thought I was just always going to be doing that for the rest of my life. And now my life is so full, so full. I couldn't even tell you the last time I had an entire day to do nothing. It's been years, years since that has happened. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be present. I'm grateful for God for bringing me here. You know, because without that power, nobody. At the end of the day, I'm just a regular bozo on a bus. You know, I've just learned how to take action. That's what I try to instill in all of you. A lot of you are no different. I'm no different. We are one and the same. And it's available to you. The same experience that I've had is available to you. And you don't have to hit the rock bottom that I hit. Most people are willing to change when the pain is great enough. Who makes the decision when the pain is great enough? You. You make the decision when the pain is great enough. You can experience more pain. I can promise you that. That rock bottom has a lower bottom. It's up to us to make the decision of how much pain we're willing to withstand until we're willing to make a change in our lives. You know, same thing with health issues. Typically, will it, people aren't willing to take their doctor's suggestion and go to the gym to exercise until they're in a life or death situation, right? It happens all the time. People go to the doctor, hey, you have risk of obesity, you're, you're, you're type whatever diabetic, right? You need to be doing this, need to be doing this or you're, you're about to become obese, or you're, you're potential of becoming a diabetic, right? You should be doing this, should be doing that. And you just write it off because the pain is not great enough. But now all of a sudden you go to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, you're extremely obese now. And, and at this rate, you know, we don't see you living for maybe more than two or three years if you continue to deteriorate your body like this. 
right? And that's when you have to make a decision if that count, if the pain is great enough in that moment to make the decision to change your life. Because if the pain is not great enough in that moment, you will not change. You will not change. And something more painful will need to happen for you in order to make the decision to change. And yeah, diamonds are made for pressure. Yeah, section three violation and don't de drop shipping. These are common in the past couple of weeks. I've seen about seven or eight of them just in our, our uh, community alone. Essentially, um, they're going to want to verify some information from you, right? So, whatever they're requesting, provide it. Uh, and a section three does not only mean drop shipping, it, it, it applies to other things. Uh, within Amazon's terms of service. And we do offer a service to help sellers like that. Uh, obviously, I don't have all the information, so I can't troubleshoot it uh, through a, a YouTube or even a private message. Um, but that's something you could absolutely jump on the phone call with my business partner, Sebastian, who's helped hundreds of accounts get reinstated. Um, so Amazon actually allows you to have two accounts. You have multiple accounts with Amazon registered under the same owner, same information. The only thing is they cannot sell the same products. That's why you see a lot of people creating like alternative accounts with family members and stuff like that. And the reason why is because if you open two accounts, you cannot sell the same inventory. Right? Because once you start, because then what happens is you could go on the same listings, right? Appear to be two different sellers when really you're just two sellers owned by one. So really it's just one seller and it'll give you a higher prioritization on the buy box, right? Because now you're two sellers, but really you're just representing one business. So Amazon doesn't want that happening because then what would prevent people from literally opening 10 wholesale Amazon businesses under the same company information and then listing the same products from those 10 stores and getting 10 chances to win the buy box and still make the money for their company. I have my reseller license, Amazon store up, just need guidance and a mentor. Well, you came to the perfect place, my friend, Santiago. That's what we offer. Guidance, mentorship, the, the whole the whole shebang. So I'll break it down very straightforward. Three main resources, access to the course content. This is the know-how. This is the step-by-step -step guided tutorials. Number two, access to live weekly calls with me, Sebastian, group of our community. This is to provide value and answer your questions. Resource number three, access to our private Facebook community. This is to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Any questions you have, it's literally a database of knowledge for the past three years. I've learned so much from my private community and I've been doing this shit for a decade. How long did it take you to go from one mil to two mil? Probably a couple months. When we were really moving, we were just we were just crushing. So Ricardo, if Amazon says the inventory is expired and you know it's not, you can request what is called a bin check. So just create a case with Seller Central, include the ASIN, and say, hey, I'd like a bin check on this ASIN. Um, the ex you're saying it's expired. The documented expiration date I have is 12-31-23. Um, please investigate this inventory and they will essentially go to the warehouse and they will pull some of your inventory, check the expiration date and communicate it with you. And if it's incorrect, the inventory will get listed back to fulfillable. And if they are in fact correct, or maybe you mislabeled it or forgot a label, then it will remain unfulfillable and you'll have to take the necessary actions to remove that inventory. What is the cheapest product we currently sell? I would say probably six, seven bucks. Listing price, you know, small might with the beauty discount. It's like, what? Sign me up. What is the best way to do a profit and loss statement? Um, so first, I, I always suggest businesses connect to QuickBooks through A2X. This will give you a lot more transparency into your company. You can connect your bank account, you can connect your debit card, your credit card, any business card you're using. Um, in this way, all of your expenses will be documented in QuickBooks. It's going to give you a much cleaner view of your company health. You know, it'll really help you understand your profit and loss because you'll have documented, you know, your expenses, your shipping, it'd be categorized, your boxes, everything that you need, it'd be categorized and separated so you could really analyze it. If all items that were now deemed stolen, what happened if all the items were sold out? Can we get in trouble? Uh, yeah, I would imagine you could absolutely still get in trouble if they're able to trace that back. So I would just 
Keep your fingers crossed and stay away from those Telegram groups with deals that are good to, too good to be true, or really any group with deals that are too good to be true. If someone's offering you a deal that just sounds like amazing, it's, it's usually there's a reason why it's so amazing. And in this case, it's because something illegal went down. Andrew, for someone just getting into FBA, what are some of the videos you would suggest going back and watching? So I would go straight to our 22 video a beginner's guide playlist. It literally gives you the rundown. It'll take you about an hour and 10 minutes to watch. It's 22 videos. It's in order sequential, starting from all the way to opening your Amazon account, all the way to sending your shipment, right? And it's right here on YouTube and it's absolutely free. So pop into there, it'll teach you a lot. It really will. All right, my friends, I'm breaking out of here. Have a beautiful Sunday, wherever you are in this world. Make sure you're doing something that makes you happy. Stay grateful and stay lit, my friends. Adios.